Uh, I would like to thank you, of course, for the invitation. And I would like to thank Karim for these nice words. I think we, we know each other since almost 20 years now, and hopefully for at least another 20 years, Karim. And hopefully we can continue working uh, together on many projects. Yeah. Today, I would like to talk about something different, not about iron oxidation. Iron oxidation, uh, uh, iron oxidizing bacteria was something that we worked uh, together for a long time. But today, I would like to talk about our permafrost project and specifically about microbial iron cycling in permafrost peatlands. And um, I would like to show you first what uh, uh, I have planned for today. I would like to introduce in the beginning our field site in uh, northern Sweden and talk about permafrost. And then I would like to talk about the main results of this project, the so-called rusty carbon sink. That's the association of reactive iron and organic carbon. And I would like to present you uh, results from the PhD thesis of Monique Patzner, where she studied the stability of this rusty carbon sink and the role of microbes in the formation and in the loss of this rust rusty carbon sink. Then I would like to show you some results on the identity of the carbon in the rusty carbon sink and how the loss of this carbon leads to greenhouse gas emission. And at the end, I would like to summarize and give you an outlook into current and future permafrost projects in our group. Now, this is the field site where we are working at. It's in uh, northern Sweden, close to the border, at the border to Norway. It's called Stordal Meyer, and it's in Abisko, uh, Sweden. And here on the right, you can see the main people responsible and involved in this work. This was Casey Bryce. She was a junior research group leader in my group for several years. She's now, uh, has a, she now has a permanent position at the University of Bristol. And here you can see Monique Patzner. She was a PhD student who did the main part of the work that I will show you today. You can see her together here with Casey in the field, protecting themselves from the mosquitoes. Now permafrost um, is uh, uh, defined as soil, rock, or sediment that is frozen for more than two consecutive years. And it uh, typically exists below a layer which freezes and thaws annually. That's the so-called active layer at the surface. And uh, permafrost covers about 25% of the Northern hemisphere and about 3% of the Earth's surface. And uh, here on this uh, map, you have an overview about uh, permafrost zones yeah, that uh, are distinguished here in, by color. And the dark purple indicates the continuous permafrost with more than 90% coverage. And then the light of the color uh, we go to discontinuous permafrost, sporadic permafrost, and then to isolated patches of permafrost. And in white, you can see here the glaciers. Now, why is permafrost important? It stores a lot of carbon. And there are estimates that it holds almost half of the world's soil organic carbon, largely in the form of permanently frozen peat. And there are estimates that it contains about 1,500 petagram of carbon. And here on this photo, you can see the active layer and you can see the typical frozen permafrost. And the active layer is the one that is then thawing uh, during the summer periods. Now, uh, the permafrost is a, a, pr a problem because it thaws and it has been considered by the United Nations in this report that was published a few years ago as one of the five largest threats to the environment. But why is this the case? Because we burned so many fossil fuels over decades uh, the global temperature increases. And as a consequence, the active layer in the permafrost deepens. That means we have a, a thawing permafrost. And this leads to the degradation of organic carbon, and as a consequence, to the production of carbon dioxide and methane. That means important greenhouse gases. And they are, of course, also emitted into the atmosphere. And uh, in this publication that came out a few years ago, researchers have suggested that even if we now stop all man-made greenhouse gas emissions. This is a self-sustaining process. That means uh, the thawing of the permafrost, the release of the greenhouse gases leads to further temperature increases and to more permafrost thaw. That means we have the cycle already running and uh, we can hardly stop it. Now, there are many things that we know about permafrost. For example, that the uh, thawing of permafrost will lead to a release of carbon in a warmer world. But there are also many things that we don't know in detail. For example, the timing, the magnitude, and the linearity of the, the feedback between the greenhouse gas emission, the further warming, and the further thawing. And therefore, there are a couple of questions that we would like to answer. And uh, two of the most important questions are, first, how much carbon is actually emitted as greenhouse gases in thawing permafrost? And second, in addition to these sources of carbon, are there also potential sinks 
of carbon installing permafrost. And this leads me to the uh, topic of today's talk. That's uh, the question whether iron oxyhydroxide minerals can function as a sink for carbon. It's known for other environments that organic carbon that is associated with reactive iron minerals can be preserved and can be protected from biodegradation. This has been shown for marine sediments, also for tropical forest soils, and also for wetlands. Now, this led us to the concept of the rusty carbon sink with the idea that organic carbon that is associated with reactive iron minerals can be protected and preserved. Yeah? That means protected from biodegradation. We can quantify the, these reactive iron minerals and the associated carbon by a sodium dithionide uh, citrate extraction. That means by a chemical extraction where we dissolve the minerals and we can quantify the carbon that is associated with these minerals. And this is also illustrated here by the schematic. In the environment, we have these iron minerals. And during the formation of these minerals, they can co-precipitate organic carbon. Also, organic carbon can sorb to the surface. And we can have interactions of iron ions or small clusters of iron ions with organic carbon, leading to iron organic carbon complexes. And altogether, this presents the rusty carbon sink. Now, one of the first questions Monique was looking at is whether such reactive iron minerals can be found in permafrost environments. And for this, we also talked to other researchers that worked on permafrost for many years, for example, to Adriana Trusiak. And she sent us these nice photographs yeah, of a uh, uh, field site in Alaska, where you can see here in these river systems, a lot of iron draining from these permafrost affected air soils. That means obviously there's a high content of iron in the soils present. You can also see that in the uh, course of permafrost soil that were taken here by Carsten Müller, uh, where you can see the iron minerals already under the microscope by these orange patches of iron oxyhydroxides. Now, Monique then studied the presence of such reactive iron minerals and associated carbon at our field site, the Stordal Meyer in Abisko. And you can see here a photograph that we took with a drone. And you can see here on the right hand, uh, right -hand side the still intact permafrost soil, the so-called palsa, where there is still intact frozen soil underneath. And this was the first field site, the location where we took cores and where we looked for these reactive iron minerals and the carbon. And here I would like to show you some first data that Monique collected. She collected these soil cores and she separated them into an organic layer, the transition layer and the mineral horizon that you can see here color coded by death. And what is plotted here is the concentration of iron that was extracted by two different methods in milligram per gram soil. In white, you see the, uh, the overall iron that was extracted with six molar HCl that includes the more crystalline iron and the less crystalline iron. And you can see that there is a significant amount of iron, especially in the transition and in the mineral horizon. Now, when we uh, analyze the reactive iron, and we quantify this with the diacyonide extraction method, you can see that especially in the transition zone, almost all of the iron that was in, uh, extracted by the uh, stronger acid was also extracted with the diacyonide method. That means here we have mainly reactive iron present in the soils. In the deeper horizons, in the mineral horizon, we have also more crystalline minerals. We then went to the synchrotron and used synchrotron-based X-ray absorption spectroscopy to get more information about the identity of the minerals. And we found that here in the transition layer, that means here where we have a lot of these reactive iron minerals, the iron, iron mineral fraction mainly consisted of iron three oxides, iron three associated with organic matter and iron two associated with organic matter, exactly as expected in this rusty carbon sink, what I, just, what I was just talking about. This is different in the deeper horizon in the mineral horizon, where we have iron associated with clays, also iron oxides, but also iron sulfur minerals, and some iron three and iron two associated with organic matter. And this analysis was pretty much confirming what we got here by the chemical extraction. Then the second question that Monique was focusing on is, uh, was how much organic carbon is now associated with these reactive iron minerals in our permafrost soil. And here you see a plot of the organic carbon in two different fractions. On the one hand, the total organic carbon here in green, and then in red, you can see the carbon that is associated with these reactive iron minerals. 
we basically quantified the carbon that was present in the dithionite extract. And what you can see here in this data was then confirmed also by electron microscopy in combination with nanosims, that means secondary ion mass spectrometry. You can see here indicated in red, the iron, it's a, it's a small particle size of 10 to 20 micrometers. You can see in white, the uh, distribution of carbon and in blue, aluminum. And what you can see here is that the carbon is almost homogeneously distributed over this iron particle. And this uh, confirms what we see here, that we have a significant fraction, about 10 to 20% of carbon associated with these iron minerals. And uh, this gives us a number, an estimate of how much of the total organic carbon is now associated with reactive iron. Now, we were interested in whether this is a specific feature for our field site there in Sweden, in Abisko, where we found these 10 to 20%, or whether this is also relevant at other uh, permafrost field sites. And for that, we had a master thesis by uh, Hannah Joss. She looked into a course that we got from Alaska, where she also found about 10 to 17% of the total organic carbon was associated with reactive iron. Then we also got some samples from the Tibetan Plateau, where we found about 10 to 14 percent of the total organic carbon being associated with reactive iron. That means these analyses suggest that the organic carbon that is associated with reactive iron is not specific for our field site, but it's present in, uh, in other permafrost environments as well. We were then interested in how stable these iron-carbon associations are. Yeah? What happens when the permafrost is thawing? Is this carbon mobilized or is it still stable? And um, I would like to explain you this by this little schematic. I explained to you earlier that when iron is oxidized, iron 2 to iron 3, and there's carbon available, this carbon becomes co-precipitated, becomes sorbed to the iron, and there are also complexes formed between iron and carbon. Now you can imagine if you have microbial iron reduction, part of anaerobic respiration that takes place under anoxic conditions, on the one hand, these microbes, they need to oxidize some organic carbon as food, as electron donor for iron reduction. And this will already produce some CO2. But also, because then this carbon becomes mobilized again and bioavailable, this is also uh, gives the potential for methanogenic organisms to produce methane. Now we then went back to our field site and we took course not only from the Pulsar region, but also from the partially thawed bog areas and also from these fen areas that are already fully thawed. Now, along this gradient, yeah, from Pulsar over bog to fen, we see a decrease in oxygen concentration because it becomes more water saturated and also a slight increase in pH. Now, I would like to show you what happens to the carbon along this thaw gradient. And here on the left, you can see the carbon data for the Pulsar region that I showed you before, where we had a 10 to 20% of carbon associated with the reactive iron minerals. Now, when we thaw the permafrost and look into the fen areas, we can actually see that this is all gone. Yeah. We still see some carbon left, but there is no carbon left that is associated with iron anymore. And this is also confirmed when we look at the iron particles. Yeah? There are some uh, iron-containing mineral particles. You can see some here and, uh, with, by electron microscopy. And when we use nanosims again, now you see the association of iron with aluminum. There will probably be some clay minerals present. But there is, definitely, there is less, almost no carbon associated with the iron minerals anymore. And we conclude from this that no reactive iron bound carbon is found anymore after complete permafrost thaw. Now, this thawing process is also indicated when we analyze the aqueous iron tool, that means dissolved reduced iron and also the dissolved organic carbon. And you can see here data over the three horizons, the organic horizon, the transition zone, and the mineral layer. And you can see the data in orange for the pulsar region, in green for the bog, and in blue for the fen area. And you can see that along this thaw gradient, we see an increase in dissolved iron too, again, suggesting that the iron minerals are dissolved. And we can see a significant increase in dissolved organic carbon, suggesting that this carbon that was associated with the minerals is now becoming mobilized and is present in dissolved phase. And we conclude from this that the iron, iron mineral dissolution, in summary, releases iron and the associated carbon into the surrounding pore water 
during the thawing process. Now, Monique was then interested in uh, finding out where exactly the rustic carbon sink is lost, because I now showed you data for the per intact permafrost for the pulsar and also then for the fan area. But she was interested whether this happens much earlier. And here on this photo, you can see this intact pulsar region, and you can see the bog area, and the fan would be more in the background. And she was interested in what happens exactly at this collapsing front. You can see here yeah, how these little hills are collapsing and then converting into the bog area. What you, by the way, see also here is this little white igloo. This is where the research station in Abisko is constantly measuring CO2 and methane that is released into the atmosphere. Now, Monique was first installing these lysimeters here and collecting pore water. And here you can see some photos and you can see that it's almost clear, yeah, pretty light uh, uh, brownish in the pulsar area. And it immediately gets deep dark brown in the, at the collapsing front and slightly brown in the bog area. We then analyzed the DOC concentrations along this pulsar to bog transition and also aqueous iron two. And you can see the DOC here in green and the iron in orange. And you can see that exactly at this collapsing front where we see the disappearance of this pulsar region and the transition into the bog area, we see these high concentrations, several hundred milligram per liter of DOC and also several millimolar or 150 milligram per liter of aqueous iron too, suggesting that this is here where the action is taking place. That means the rusty carbon sink is already lost during this pulsar collapse. We were then interested in finding out whether microbes and what kind of microbes contribute yeah, to the formation and especially to the dissolution of these minerals at this transition zone. And we would like to find out who are the microbial key players. And for this, we use 16S RNA, uh, RNA gene sequencing. And you can see here these little uh, circles and the size of the circles indicates the abundance of a certain type of organism or certain metabolic type. And here, first, you can see the abundance of iron reducing microbes. And you can see that in the pulsar region, yeah, we have some iron reducers, but especially at the collapsing front, the abundance is relatively high. We did this analysis both on DNA and RNA level. That means we, uh, with the DNA, we analyze the abundance of organisms. And with the RNA, we also uh, analyze the activity. Today, I will show you only the DNA based data. That means the abundance of organisms. But I can tell you that the RNA-based analysis basically confirmed what we found out with the, on the DNA level. We also tried to identify some of the typical groups of, of, of organisms performing a certain metabolism. And in this case, for the iron reducers, we found Geobacter, typical iron-reducing bacterium, also Clostridium, fermenters that are also known to reduce iron, and Rotopharax, another iron reducer. We were then also interested whether iron oxidizing bacteria are there, because if we have this transition to a more reducing environment, but still oxygen penetration from the surface, there are these interfaces where you can imagine that also iron oxidizing bacteria are present. And now in this, in this dark orange, you see the iron reducers. That was what I showed you before. And now in this light beige, you can see the iron oxidizing bacteria. And you can see that especially at, in the deeper layers of the collapsing front, there are some iron oxidizing bacteria present. And when we analyzed their identity, we found about 80% of sideroxidants and about 20% of gallionella. These organisms are known to perform microaerophilic iron oxidation. That means iron oxidation with oxygen as electron acceptor. But some of them, they were also found in nitrate reducing iron oxidizing cultures. And maybe there's anaerobic iron oxidation as well as aerobic iron oxidation taking place. Now, what is interesting, because we, on the DNA and RNA-based level, we found iron oxidizing bacteria yeah, in addition to the iron reducers, but we see the collapse, we see the disappearance of this rustic carbon sink. This suggests that these iron oxidizing bacteria are probably outcompeted by a higher number of iron reducers. And overall, we see a loss of the rustic carbon sink with permafrost thaw. Now we then started also looking into the carbon in more detail because we were interested in what is the identity of the carbon and what is the bioavailability of the carbon that was associated initially with the minerals and is then released. And to analyze this, we use the high resolution mass spectrometry technique. It's called Fourier transform ion cyclone resonance mass spectrometry. 
And we analyzed the dissolved organic carbon in the sodium dithionide citrate extract. That means we determined what kind of organic molecules were associated with the minerals in the pulsar region and then also in the, at the collapsing front. And you typically plot this data uh, as an example in these Van Creveden diagrams, where you plot the OC ratio versus the HC ratio of molecules that have been identified by the mass spectrometer. And if you, hear, if you see here darker dots, this indicates a higher abundance of a certain fraction of molecules that have a certain ratio of OC and HC. That means the higher the, the abundance, the darker these regions. And now I would like to focus here on two fractions. The first one is this brown fraction, where we uh, indicate more aliphatic, that means more bioavailable bio organic compounds. In contrast to this lower region indicated in gray, the fraction two, that is more aromatic and less bioavailable. When we now compare the samples that we took from the pulsar region in the transition zone to, what, to the compounds that we still find at the collapsing front, we see that the gray region is maybe a little bit weaker and less prominent, but it's still there, while fraction one is almost completely gone. That means the bioavailable fraction is gone from the particles. Yeah? That means it's lost, that means it went into solution. That means the more bioavailable aliphatic carbon is mobilized along with the pulsar collapse. And this is also confirmed by acetate analysis. Acetate is a compound that is formed by microbial degradation of organic matter, for example, by fermentation. And we can see that especially here at the collapsing front, where we also have the high soft iron two and the high DOC, this is where we measure in the, uh, acetate in the millimolar uh, concentration range. We also compare this to the overall DOC, and you can see that about 10% of the dissolved organic carbon uh, is represented by acetate. That's a lot, suggesting that degradation of this bioavailable carbon leads to a pulse of acetate. And acetate is also a fantastic substrate for many organisms, iron reducers, but also for organisms uh, performing uh, acidogenic um, mesanogenesis. That means acetate is, is really yummy food for many microbes. And therefore, we were then interested next how this all, how this all, these processes, the collapse of the, of the carbon sink, yeah, the release of the carbon, how this now leads into CO2 and methane formation. That means the formation of greenhouse gases. And first we looked into the microbes again. And uh, here you can see again, the data for the iron reducers and the iron oxidizers. And now in dark gray, you can see the methanogens and in light gray, the methanotrophs. That means organisms producing methane and organisms oxidizing methane. And you can see that here in the pulsar region, yeah, we have already some methanogens and methane oxidizers, especially here at the surface, suggesting that some methane is diffusing upwards and they use oxygen to oxidize the methane. But when you compare this to the collapsing front, you can see here a huge abundance of methanogenic organisms now fitting to all these other data where we have the release of the carbon, where we have bioavailable carbon. And now these organisms become really active and produce obviously a lot of methane. What we also find is uh, methane oxidizing bacteria. And what I would also like to highlight here that we in particular find hydrogenotrophic methanogens. That means organisms that produce methane from hydrogen and CO2, not from acetate. And we did not measure hydrogen, unfortunately, so far. This is something that we will do in the, in the next field campaign. Now, you can see now that uh, um, at this collapsing front, where we measured the uh, acetate, where we measured the DOC. This is also the region where we measure the highest carbon dioxide and methane emission rates. This is what you can see here plotted in fluxes, micromole per square meter per second. Here, the left axis is the CO2, indicated by the light gray, and in dark gray, it's the methane. You can see that also in the pulsar and in the bog areas, these gases are produced, but here at the collapsing front, both gases, CO2 and methane, are produced at the higher, highest rates. And uh, uh, again, this suggests in summary that this organic carbon that was previously associated with the iron becomes now mobilized and is also metabolized through greenhouse gases by the microbial community at the collapsing front already. Now, at that point, I would like to, to summarize what I showed you about the rusty carbon sink. In the pulsar region, 
obviously we found some iron oxidizers. They uh, contribute probably in addition to abiotic iron oxidation to the formation of the rusty carbon sink. Now, during the transition to the bog area, when there is partial thawing, the water becomes more saturated and anoxic. We see that iron reducing bacteria dissolve the minerals. We have iron 2 in solution. We have free organic carbon. We have acetate. And some CO2 is already produced, for example, by iron reducers, because they need to oxidize some of the carbon to CO2 to reduce the iron 3 to iron 2 already. Now, we also saw that methanogenesis is taking place. We, we saw that in particular hydrogenotrophic, that means hydrogen based methane formation, is playing a role. And uh, we suggested that this is favored by the slight increase in pH because these organisms, they like a slightly higher pH than the ones that use acetate. And of course, this is possible because we have this huge amount of carbon mobilization. And this suggests that this outcompetes acetoclastic methanogenesis. Now, what we also saw, and this is something that I did not show you today, is that when we analyzed course over the seasons, we see that in late summer, the water level slightly decreases again. And we have, to some extent, a reformation of the rusty carbon sink again, because then the water level decreases. We have oxygen penetration, and the iron 2 that is present here in solution becomes reoxidized abiotically, but also by iron oxidizing bacteria. And this suggests that in the early summer, when we have the really wet conditions, the carbon yeah, that uh, uh, is, is produced represents a source for these organisms yeah, that can be metabolized. And later, the minerals that are produced again yeah, form a carbon sink again in the late summer when there are oxidizing conditions again. And, uh, but ultimately, when we go from Pulsa to Fen, we see during the summer that we have a significant loss of the rusty carbon sink. And uh, uh, along with complete permafrost saw, and this all leads to increasing methane and CO2 concentrations and emissions. Monique also did a rough estimate uh, calculation how important the rusty carbon sink is for the environment overall. And again, here's the number of carbon that was estimated to be stored in permafrost environments, about 1,500 petagram. And if our estimates of maybe 7 to 20% of carbon that is associated with directive iron is valid, this represents about 100 to 300 petagram of carbon. And if all of this carbon would be bioavailable and mobilized as greenhouse gases, yeah, we can estimate and we can compare this to human fossil fuel emission, where we know that roughly 10 petagram of carbon are um, um, uh, released as greenhouse gases per year. The, the loss of the rusty carbon sink represents about 10 to 30 times the amount of carbon that is released yearly through anthropogenic fossil fuel emissions. That means even if these estimates are a little bit lower, it shows that it's definitely a significant fraction of carbon that is associated with the iron minerals and that can be potentially released during permafrost thaw. Now, at that point, I would also like to show you how, what we are, we are currently doing and what kind of projects yeah, we are, we are uh, running in our lab at the moment to learn more about this rusty carbon sink. And first, I would like to introduce here Prachi Joshi. She's a new junior research group leader in my group. She likes Swiss chocolate, and she's providing chocolate to the group during the fieldwork always. And you can also see that she really likes peat. Yeah? She really likes to collect cores and soils and uh, uh, analyze the soil later in the lab. And she's supervising several students at the moment in my lab together with me. And I would like to show you briefly what they are currently working on. The first one is Eva Fockenreiter. She's really interested in the rusty carbon sink itself. And she's currently looking into how much and what, ty what type of organic carbon can be bound uh, to the polycrystalline iron phases via sorption and co-precipitation. And her hypotheses are, first, co-precipitation will bind higher amounts of organic carbon. And uh, she also uh, looks into the, the second hypothesis that iron phases will preferentially bind more oxidized, higher molecular weight compounds and not more reduced low molecular weight moieties. And for this, she's uh, collecting water in the field. She's filtering the water. She brings it back to Tübingen and then she adds ferry hydride. Yeah? Either she precipitates the ferry hydride in presence of the water or she adds it to look into sorption. And you can see the water here before and after sorption. You can see that uh, then uh, water becomes clear because the organic carbon binds to the minerals. And then she again uses FTICRMS 
to analyze the fraction of molecules that is preferentially sorbed to the minerals. We then have a second PhD student, Katrin Wunsch. She's looking into the iron metabolizing microbes. And she's interested in the role of iron metabolizing bacteria in permafrost iron carbon cycling and in the release of greenhouse gases. And she follow, follows the hypothesis that microbial iron oxidation reduces the release of organic carbon by reforming reactive iron minerals and these iron carbon associations and reducing conditions created by the thaw, increase the abundance of iron reducers and the production of greenhouse gases. And she collects cores, and she's at the moment setting up a lot of enrichments for iron reducing bacteria, but also for many others. For example, for microaerophilic and nitrate reducing iron oxidizers, but also for methane oxidizing bacteria that couple methane oxidation to iron reduction. There are some studies that suggest that methane can be oxidized coupled to oxygen reduction in these environments, but so far there is no work done on iron reduction coupled to methane oxidation. Now, finally, the third PhD project that we have running at the moment is Sankita Chauhan. She's looking into iron carbon flocks. You can see here an example in, in her hand. And you can see these flocks in these little ponds there in the permafrost area. And she's interested in the identity and the redox state of the carbon and iron in these flocks because we believe that the formation of these flocks along the thaw gradient yeah, during reoxidation uh, could be the start of forming the rusty carbon sink again. And she's now studying whether redox fluctuations in the pore water and in the surface water are responsible for the formation and transformation of the flocks. And the type of experiments that she's doing are the following. She's collecting these flock samples and also water samples, and then she exposes them to reducing conditions, to oxidizing conditions. She uh, is doing free thaw cycles, yes, it's freezing samples, thawing them, freezing, thawing. And then she's analyzing the flocks that you can see here on the right here in, this, in these uh, glass tubes already with all kinds of methods yeah, to get an, some information about the composition, the identity, uh, uh, and the structure of these particles. Okay, at that point, I'm at the end of my presentation, and uh, I would like to thank all our collaborators, and I would like to thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andres, uh, for the talk. Um, so I see many hand raises. So uh, first on my list is Nea. So Nea, if you want to ask your question. I was uh, just reacting and applauding for an excellent talk by Andreas, but I do have a question as well. Thank you. Uh, well, it was a wonderful talk. Uh, and I, I think I've been always fascinated about peatlands, uh, but it's been sort of a really nice A to Z overview for me. Um, I have uh, like two questions. One is more of like to understand a little better on the quantification of how much is TOC stored in the peatlands. And yeah. I think at some point, you had a slide on where you quantified about 10 to 20% of TOC based on the extraction and the nanosims. Um, maybe I just missed it, but I couldn't follow how you, uh, so I understood the quantification part from the extraction, but yeah. how was that confirmed that that was the same amount from the nanosims? I mm -hmm. missed that connection. Yeah. And the second part was... Uh, can, I, can I answer this first? It may be easy, otherwise I forget the first question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the nanosims we did not use for quantification. Yeah, okay. the nanosims we only, I mean, you know, nanosims you only look at the very, very few particles. Yeah, this is the same problem with electron microscopy. You have to make sure that it's representative. And yeah, but we used the, the, uh, the extraction for quantification. That means we determined the TOC and then we determined the fraction that is associated with the minerals and we okay. correlated only these two. This was the 10 to 20 percent. Okay. And the nanosims only served to confirm that the carbon is associated with the minerals, yeah, where you can see that it matches in some of these particles, yeah. Okay. And, you know, I mean, uh, we, we looked at many particles, as many as possible, yeah. We had one week of uh, instrument time at the nanosims. And then, of course, you get a, an, an idea about what is representative for the pulsar sample and what is representative for the fan sample. And uh, in, the, in the paper that Monique published in the supporting information, there are more particles that okay. show this correlation. Okay, okay, that makes clear. So I didn't miss the connection there. No, no, okay. no. Um, the second question is more about, uh, you know, you showed about how 
The reactive iron minerals can uh, serve as a rusty carbon sink by either co-precipitation or sorbing, adsorbing iron. And I think at the end, you propose, you mentioned a PhD student who is sort of working in figuring out which of these form of uh, complexation of organic matter with the, uh, whether it's via co-precipitation or adsorption method uh, has a higher, let's say, uh, strength of uh, storing or sequestering uh, organic carbon. But I'm more curious about what's your thoughts on the reactivity of uh, eventually in the condition or the dynamics you have shown of the transition and like the, along the core, in the sense that uh, do you see that if there's a major portion of organic carbon bound to via co-precipitation, mm -hmm. uh, it's just that that complexation itself results in a higher bioavailability of that organic matter, regardless of the type of organic carbon bound in that, or is it like, what is it, what are the kind of factors which will dictate mm -hmm. uh, that yeah. uh, bioavailability of that organic carbon in, yeah. So I, I don't know if it's a super clear. Very good question. Yeah, this is exactly what Eva Falkenreiter and Katrin Munch are also doing together. Um, they are doing experiments where they collect samples from the field and where they prepare some in the lab, where they uh, take the uh, organic carbon from the field, they sorb it, they co-precipitate it, and then they induce reducing conditions again mm. to determine which carbon is mobilized. And they do that in the presence of a microbial community that can metabolize, metabolize the carbon and then we measure CO2 and methane formation. Then what we, what we can do is of course, we can using FTIC RMS, we can determine what kind of carbon is bound to the minerals initially. Then during the reduction process, what kind of carbon is remaining at the minerals and which fraction is mobilized. And then after incubation, we can determine from the mobilized fraction which fraction is transformed, being transformed into methane and CO2 and which ones are left. Mm. Hopefully this will give us an idea about the identity of the compounds that are preferentially used. Yeah, And um, this is of course tricky because you always have these different pools of particulate organic matter. Yeah, Then you have these colloids and the flux and then you have the truly dissolved. And with the FTIC RMS, you analyze only a small fraction of this. This is one of the big issues, yeah, because it needs to be dissolved and then you need to purify it and then you lose some material in between. That means we always have to keep in mind the FTIC RMS also always represents only a small part of what we are looking at. Mm -hmm. What is also important, uh, initially we thought we can just add a pure culture of a type of organism and see which fraction can be used by this. Uh, preliminary experiments showed that this was not successful because you need to have a complex microbial community to degrade this complex organic matter. We tried it with Chevanella because Chevanella can do a lot of things. Then we thought, ah, Chevanella, it can ferment, it can reduce nitrate and can use oxygen. And when we incubated Chevanella with such an organic matter extract, simply nothing happened. It did not use anything. Yeah, And this was kind of disappointing, but it also made a lot of sense because this is why we have these complex communities where you have exoenzymes yeah, that degrade the compounds you have radical formation that contributes to the breaking of the bonds. And I think this, this is hopefully what we will get in these additional uh, PhD projects in the next three years. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you for the good questions. We have also Karim, uh, his friend is Leis, so. Uh, yeah, so, so, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Andreas. That was, a, that was really nice. This is an exciting study and a very nice talk. Um, I, I think that my first question is, uh, is related to, to the one you just answered, so uh, I don't know if that's just a way to rephrase it or maybe a bit different. So when you get into this highly reactive uh, um, part where you, you have a lot of iron too, uh, iron reduced in, in, in DOC, so I, I was just wondering, so in the solution, the speciation about, of, of iron in the let's say in the dissolved fraction. So I guess, I don't know, your dissolved might be below 0.2 micron or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, I guess it's mostly iron too. And so then, and then, so yeah. And I guess a, a big part is, uh, is complex by organic matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of, yeah. mm -hmm. there's a lot of iron too. And of course there's also, you see some iron three. Now, one of the issues is 
the way how we analyze it in the lab is using the, the lab is using the ferrocyanide assay. Yeah? And of course, what you do is you stabilize the samples by HCl. And this is a big problem because then, of course, you acidify, you break a lot of these iron organic matter associations already. Yeah, this is one of the, of the issues. And also at this acidic pH, you induce some redox reactions. Mm. That means if you have, for example, organic matter associated with iron-3 as a complex, now you acidify, you break the bond, you have a low pH, and now the redox potential of the iron-3 becomes so positive that the reduced organic matter is transferring electrons and is reducing your iron-3 to iron-2. That means my guess is that with these ferrocyanide assays, we always underestimate the iron-3 organic matter complexes. Because okay, so yeah, because in the synchrotron analysis, we see that iron-3 organic matter is really important. And we see, we usually get less in the ferrocyanide assay, yeah? And okay. for, for me, this shows that in the, by the acidic extraction, yeah, we lose some of the iron-3 by redox reactions that happen during the extraction. Mm. Yeah, so uh, I guess, so then it, it becomes very difficult to, to measure the true, uh, let's say the true dissolved iron. I mean the the, the free iron, and and yeah. because that would be great. I mean to have a complexation constants yeah. because then yeah. I, I think I guess for the modeling and understanding how much iron two uh, iron two uh, uh, free iron two you have uh, would be. Important. And we can we can measure. I mean we can take the pore water and we can filter mm -hmm. it with 0 0.2, yeah, and then we know what is per definition yeah uh, dissolved, yeah. And then it, then it doesn't matter whether it's iron three or iron two. We just know it's dissolved, yeah. And uh, I think the speciation is then a different problem. Yeah, because, because the, I mean, if you want to predict uh, which, I mean, whether you might have a precipitation also, also of all the phases and so on. And I guess uh, three three iron two might be more available than uh, complex yeah. iron two for some microbes at least. Yes. Yeah. That's. I mean, there's also something we had uh, uh, this PhD student Chao Peng who was looking into oxidation of complex iron-2 by mm -hmm. photophobic iron oxidizers and nitrate-dependent mm -hmm. iron oxidizers. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they can use it, yeah? They can use these complex species, mm -hmm. yeah? Not all okay. species, not all microbes, yeah? But some of them can use these complexes. And so two other tiny questions. So the, the first one, just remind me, so for uh, cedar oxidants, uh, uh, is it autotroph for carbon or? Yeah, cedar oxidants is autotroph, yeah? And I mean, uh, what is really interesting, oxidants and galonella, yeah, typically we describe them as microaerophilic iron oxidizers, yeah, autotrophic. But now in, in, in these autotrophic nitrate reducing iron oxidizing cultures that we now have, and now we have in our lab, we have now three, and all of them contain strains that are closely related to oxidants and galonella. And oxidants and galonella, they all have genes, yeah, that suggests that they should be able to produce nitrate. Okay, and, and could, could that be a, a reason why they are outcompeted by the, the, the iron reducing bacteria? Yes, for example, because there is not so much nitrate. Now this is another, I mean, the fact that you don't measure a lot of nitrate doesn't mean that nitrate reduction is not important because it could be a cryptic cycle, yeah? Because you have a lot of ammonium production, there is ammonium there. And because you have oxygen, yeah, there's also a high chance that you have ammonium oxidation. And I guess if there is nitrate formed, the nitrate will be immediately consumed by nitrate reducers. Not only by iron oxidizing nitrate reducers, but by just heterotrophic nitrate reducers. We don't measure a lot of nitrate. It's really low. But it also makes a lot of sense because nitrate is a very good electron acceptor. Therefore, I mean, what we would need to do is we need to do a, a cryptic cycling experiments where we spike with nitrate and then see what is happening. And very uh, last question, sorry. Uh, so eventually, so, um, so you have really a high uh, iron redu reduction over that that zone, that pretty specific zone, and so on. So how do you? So eventually, I mean, if of course, if you want to integrate over the whole scale and so on, you you have to to somehow measure this uh, spatial heterogeneity or characterize this uh, spatial heterogeneity. I mean, you have done coring and so on. I, I'm just wondering. So the, the the heterogeneity is pretty high, isn't it? Or or do you feel this like is it? one of the is one of the biggest problems? Yeah, it's very heterogeneous. Yeah. <clears throat> that means the first two days we spend only by basically walking around and exploring the field site because the field site is changing from year to year. We are now there since five years. And every year when you come, it looks different. 
Yeah, there is, for example, last year when we were there, there were huge amounts of cotton grass growing everywhere. I never saw that in the years before in, in these amounts. And sometimes you come back, you want to sample at a certain area that has been a pulsar the year before. It's now already transformed into a bog. Originally, when we started the work, the research station, they told us they expect that there will still be permafrost until the year 2050. Last year, when we were there, they changed their prediction to 2030 because the, melt, the thaw is going so fast. We were there, I mean, now two times where the temperature was close to 30 degrees Celsius. 30 degrees Celsius. It was warmer both times than in Tübingen when we left. Yeah, and this is just when you are up there, it's you, when you, you theoretically you can walk around in short pants and t-shirts, but then the mosquitoes will kill you. But uh, uh, this it's it's really warm, and you can imagine how tough that is to work for the students. Yeah, this year they either had 30 degrees and billions of mosquitoes where you were sweating like crazy, or then the temperature dropped to five degrees and it was raining and it was really 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 cold. Yeah. And the students yeah, before, that's attractive. <laughs> that's, that's how it. you sell it. <laughs> the, the students they liked the cold better. It's easier to work at the end. Thanks, Andreas. Yeah, thank you, Karim. And we maybe have time for some questions from Francois. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas, for the very important studies in the context of uh, climate change. I think it's very important that as a community, we do such studies and uh, this is really great. Um, I, I had a question about the, you mentioned the aliphatic carbon uh, compounds mm -hmm. were the most uh, bioavailable. Mm -hmm. um, indeed, uh, they are available uh, if you have uh, electron acceptors. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I understand well, the the, this iron uh, mineral aliphatic carbon association, which is in the PALSA sites, for instance, mm -hmm. is highly reducing. And so uh, what wh what are the electron acceptors then, which are fueling all the all the thing when it when it uh, warms up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. That I mean, it's definitely the iron three. Yes, iron three there. I guess nitrate plays a role, even if we cannot measure it, yeah, because uh, there's there's nitrogen and also the microbial community data suggests that there is ammonium oxidation. Okay. Then sulfate reduction is not so important, yeah. You, when you when you are there, you don't smell anything, and you also don't see a lot of sulfur minerals. Interestingly, in the synchrotron data, yeah, we found some evidence for sulfide minerals. Mm. There was a surprise, yeah, because. Since these five years when we were working there, I never, you know, the smell of sulfide. Yeah, it's so intense mm. yeah, and characteristic. You don't smell this. Yeah, this, that means, yeah. I, yeah, I don't think that sulfate is very important. I, but, I mean, yeah. Sorry, but then the, yeah, if, if it, for instance, if it's uh, some iron three, which is uh, present mm. in this assemblage, then all the thermodynamic conditions are met so that they're could be already some reactivity in the permafrost, right? In the pulsar sites. That, yeah. Because you have, you have the right organic matter, you have the right electron acceptors, yeah. which is probably the case. So is then the key for all that, just the temperature? Meaning that uh, it's, it's just not occurring so much in the permafrost because it's uh, cool, cold? Or yeah, is, it, is it a matter of kinetics uh, more than anything? Or yeah. is it something else? Yeah, I mean, in the permafrost, uh, there is CO2 release. And of course, the permafrost itself is oxic from the surface. Yeah, that means when the permafrost is thawing from the surface, mm -hmm. yeah, there is oxygen penetration, mm -hmm. and there are estimates that uh, oxygen, just because, I mean, it's a gas, it's diffusing from the surface. Yeah, it can take up two electrons. It's definitely a very important electron acceptor at the mm -hmm. pulsar side already. When when you have the active layer at the surface, there is mm -hmm. for sure a lot of carbon oxidized just by the oxygen. We also have a fourth project that is brand new that I did not mention today. And this is the effect of oxygen transport via roots into this surface. Because okay. what I did not mention today, you, when, you, when you look at the pictures here at the bottom, yeah, you see mm. that there's plant growth, yeah? Mm. And I mean, when you, when you take these cores, this is a very dense network yeah, of root material. Mm. And there is a lot of transport of oxygen into the subsurface. And this is something that, Together with Marie Mühe, yeah, we, we got funded a new PhD project. And uh, we have a new student who, will, who actually just started a few days ago. 
And she will now look into the role of oxygen that is transported via the roots into the subsurface as electron acceptor. Uh, great. But I predict that this is also playing a very important role also for recycling the iron. Sure. Because if there is, and we know that there is kind of iron plaque forming at the roots. Hmm. And uh, therefore, I wouldn't be surprised if you see at the root surface iron oxidizing bacteria, and then iron again serves as an electron acceptor. And regarding your question with the electron acceptors, of course, there's also methanogenesis. But first, you need to convert the carbon into hydrogen. Yeah. 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 And the aliphatic carbon is not, uh, it cannot be fermented, for instance. It, you need to yeah. oxidize it first, and then it exactly, works. First. Yeah. Yeah, this is what we saw. You need to have a network of microbes. It's not enough to have just one metabolic group. Mm. Yeah, you need to have the community present. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Francois.